Dr. M from BMC here. Today we are going to cover a topic that every pet guardian should be well versed in, hip dysplasia. Let's ensure that your cats and dogs can strut through life in comfort. Join me, you'll learn something today. First, let's discuss what canine and feline hip dysplasia is. It's a condition that begins as the animal is growing and we get hip joint laxity. This instability and laxity in the joint is responsible for changes occurring to the bones and surrounding structures of that joint, which causes the symptoms. The hip joint consists of a ball and a socket, femoral head and the acetabulum. As the femoral head doesn't fit properly into the acetabulum over time, that will cause changes to the shape of the acetabulum and the femoral head. There is a progressive lack of cartilage and there will be the development of osteophytes and arthritis. As you can imagine, this disease process is painful. So large dog breeds are more commonly affected than small dog breeds. However, every single dog has the potential of developing hip dysplasia and cats do as well. Some of the most common symptoms for hip dysplasia is things like lameness. So it will be one or both of the back legs that they will be limping on. Sometimes we can also notice gait changes, like they might do more bunny hopping instead of their normal gait. They might start to weight shift onto their thoracic limbs. They might be reluctant to get up or stretch or jump up. Anything that requires them to extend their pelvic limbs is going to be a thing that they start to avoid or that they won't extend their pelvic limbs as much as they normally would. We can also see that these dogs can lose muscle mass in the pelvic limbs. And of course, this is painful, although not all animals will demonstrate to us a lot of pain. Some of them are quite stoic. Some of them are very good at hiding pain. Next, let's cover what the causes of hip dysplasia are. And there are a lot of myths and misconceptions that go flying around the internet on this one. But what the research tells us is that by far and away, hip dysplasia is hereditary. That means that genetics are the absolute biggest contributing factor here. So buying from health tested parents, whether that's OFA or pen hip x-rays will dramatically help you to assess the risk. According to OFA statistics, if you have a dog with OFA excellent graded hips and they are bred to another dog with excellent hips, then the likelihood of those offspring having hip dysplasia is as low as 3%. If you have parents that have hip dysplasia and you end up breeding those, the likelihood of the offspring having hip dysplasia is as high as 65%. So this is quite a genetically linked issue. All that said, poor nutrition can also contribute and so feeding a research-based diet that meets WSAVA guidelines and is formulated for the right size of breed that you have is also Key. Next, let's cover how we diagnose hip dysplasia. Light sedation or maybe even a bit more sedation than that is absolutely required. This is so that we can properly position the animal to take the x-rays and also because if those hips are painful, they're going to resist us from positioning for these x-rays and then you don't get diagnostic x-rays. The most accurate method at a young age is the pen hip method and this can be used on puppies and is quite accurate at predicting what amount of dysplasia they will end up with as adults. This does require whoever is taking these x-rays to undergo some special training. Not all GP veterinarians will have this certification, so you may need to see an orthopedic specialist who should be able to help you out. When the animal is sedated, we also will perform a physical exam and we are checking for laxity in the hip joint. We call this the Ortolani sign and that will also be part of the workup. If the Ortolani sign is present, it generally means those dogs will have arthritis by the time they're even a year of age. We also can take OFA style x-rays. These are most commonly used by breeders. However, they are not 
accurate enough with young puppies. It's recommended the earliest you would take a set is at one year, but then you need to recheck them when the animal is two years old to get a final idea of what those hips look like. If you have a young animal that you are concerned about, one and two years of age is too late to start a lot of interventions, and so you would need to pursue the pen hip x-rays instead because the earlier intervention can be implemented the better it is for the animal. Let's dive into the treatment of hip dysplasia. The most important thing is that early intervention is absolutely crucial here. This is because we are trying to start intervening before the hip joint cartilage is damaged, more painful, and arthritic. Puppies as young as 10 weeks old can be appropriately diagnosed with hip dysplasia and treatment can be started. Between 10 and 18 weeks old is often when we would consider a surgical procedure, juvenile pubic symphysiodesis. This is a surgery that needs to be performed by an orthopedic specialist. However, we do have research showing that the outcome is generally quite successful. JPS is a fairly minimally invasive surgery that is performed by closing a growth plate near the bottom of the pelvis. This results in selective growth of the pelvis so that the acetabulum ends up covering more of the femoral head over the next four to six months. For treatment option number two, we are going to discuss the double or triple pelvic osteotomy. This is another option that is available for immature dogs, generally less than eight to 10 months of age. In this procedure, you cut into the pelvis in two or three double or triple spots, and that part of the pelvis is rotated to provide a better coverage of the femoral head reducing the hip laxity. The DPO is a less invasive procedure as only two cuts are required. And that tends to be more commonly used these days as we've had advancements with our orthopedic plate options. Needs to be noted that dogs who already have arthritic changes are not going to be candidates for this type of procedure. Reports of long-term function tend to be good to excellent. The third treatment option is a total hip replacement or THR. This is considered the option for dogs who are too old for the previous two treatments we discussed or dogs that already have arthritic changes present by the time they are diagnosed. A total hip replacement involves removing the femoral head and also reshaping the acetabulum to create a new and artificial hip joint. Dogs need to be older than one year of age before this procedure can be considered, and in general, this procedure is an excellent one that gives dogs greatly reduced pain and a wonderfully improved hip range of motion. Last, let's cover our fourth treatment option. This is a bit more of a salvage procedure. Femoral head ostectomies aren't recommended very often. An FHO is where the ball of the femur is cut off and nothing is put into its place. Now what this does is it does reduce some of the hip pain because there is no arthritic femoral head inside the arthritic acetabulum anymore. That said, there also isn't a functional hip joint there anymore and the weight bearing has to strictly go through the muscles around the hip down the leg. For very small animals, they can have a decent return to function sometimes. The results of this surgery are quite variable. The goal is just to reduce the pain in the dysplastic and arthritic joint. And so that is why I mention it as the last treatment option and only in very select cases. Let's move on to discussing medical management. The Exact medical management will depend on a bunch of factors. If your dog or cat is younger or active, then medical management alone is not an appropriate option. However, we will have some older animals that are dealing with other health issues, and sometimes in those cases, we will choose to pursue medical management. Now, all animals with hip dysplasia need to be kept a lean body condition score of four to five for dogs and a five out of nine for cats. On medical management alone, we also cannot expect a very active lifestyle. 
we need to limit exercise to whatever that individual patient can tolerate without becoming more painful. In the previous series I did where I went more in depth on arthritis management, I have a video where we cover the different options for pain management. So if you wish for more information on those medication and supplement options, please see the video description. Part of management also means that we need to be pursuing conditioning and rehab with a certified professional. Swimming is contraindicated for these animals as when dogs and cats swim, the pelvic limb motion is not controlled and is not an appropriate exercise. It's also going to increase pain and symptoms whenever they need to extend that hip. You need to be using ramps for vehicles and couches, beds, that sort of thing. It's also important that we modify the environment to minimize issues like slipping. So making sure you have rugs or yoga mats for pathways that your dog or cat can use. I just want to reiterate here that medical management is simply trying to minimize pain and the impact on quality of life. However, the hip dysplasia is going to continue to progress and this is not a treatment. It's simply a bit of a band-aid to try to buy us some time. I love interacting with you in the comments, so if you have a suggestion for a topic you'd like me to cover in the future, don't hesitate to leave that down below. And I highlight a comment every single week. Thank you so very much for leaving your thoughts and views and suggestions. It means a lot to me. I put up a new video most Fridays, so I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.